So today we're going to be talking about governance in Malaysia. And uh, we've got some experts with us uh, from the MACD, as well as um, Dr. K.M. Loy. I've been very fortunate to have known K.M. Uh, for quite a while now, as we uh, were co-editors and we were involved in the um, development of ISO 37000, the governance um, of organization standard. So without any further ado, I'm going to first of all hand over to Dr. Loy to introduce Governance Malaysia for us. Thank you, thank you, Claire. Uh, let me share my slide. Uh, all right, so, okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen out there. Uh, my name is Lloyd K.M. Lloyd. Uh, uh, I'm representing uh, an organization by the name uh, called the ABMS Malaysia, which is the Association of, of uh, uh, Anti-Private Management System Practitioners Malaysia. So uh, I'm very much uh, honored uh, to be invited by the Good, Acad good Governance Academic to share some thoughts on governance uh, in Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, a quick background about myself. I've been involved in, uh, in, uh, in the manufacturing industry for more than 15 years. I'm also represent Malaysia in most of these uh, management system standards, starting from ISO 9000, 14000, social responsibility 26000. And uh, recently for the last uh, five, six years, I've been involved in this technical committee 309, which is called the uh, governance of organization, covering ISO 37001, the anti bribery management system, and also whistleblowing management system and uh, new others uh, work, uh, work item as well. My involvement, uh, especially has been in anti-corruption advocacy uh, since the year 2000. Yeah, so this is a little bit background about myself. A, uh, well, if you realize uh, that in Malaysia, as early as uh, 2008, uh, the uh, Security Commission of Malaysia has requested uh, the public listed company to submit the CSR report. And it has been made mandatory then, since then in the uh, year 2007. Yeah? And among the important uh, requests or requirement under the CSR, are reporting is to, to describe the CSR activities and practices that is undertaken by this public listed company. Since then, after the year 2016, the Security Commission has requested the public listed company now to submit what we call a sustainability report. And this sustainability report framework is actually uh, trying to uh, present or help the organization to present uh, their uh, reach out on the yes, environmental, social, and also the economic perspective of it. And today, most of us realize that there's a new uh, uh, buzzword called the ESG, environmental social governance. And it becomes such a fast moving trend that uh, the, our Busan Malaysia is also now looking and requesting most of the public company to uh, go into this ESG uh, reporting as well. Yeah, and some of these requirements perhaps under this uh, sustainability reporting is to improve the quality of our sustainability uh, related practices and reporting, and also to support that with a big focus on this sustainability and the capital market as well, okay? Now, most of the public leases company are required to uh, address this corporate governance. And in Malaysia, uh, the, 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 the authority has come up with a guidance called the Malaysian Code on Corporate Governance in the year 2021. Similarly, other countries, for example, UK do have their corporate governance code, Singapore has the code of corporate governance and the basic principle actually to address the corporate governance in this perspective. The, board of the, uh, the role of the board, the compensation, strategic oversight, and most importantly, the risk management aspect of it. So uh, along with this, most of these organizations in the country have their own uh, code of uh, uh, 
conduct on corporate governance at the international level, uh, the ISO, ISO PC 309 has actually published this international standard known as the ISO 37,000, the governance of organization. And this is actually one of the most important uh, useful document, measurement document to be uh, for organization to adopt and use it. And I explain a little bit further uh, later. And as I mentioned, Malaysia, most public listed companies are, are required to address this corporate governance using this code. And this code of conduct actually has been revised for the last six years. The last revision was, of course, in the year 2021, and that was the previous revision in the year 2017. Uh, the rationale behind it, why there was a, 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 a revision in the year 2021, because uh, Malaysia passed a Section 17 Capital A corporate liability provision in the year 2018, and it was enforced in the year June, in, the, in June 2020. And naturally, uh, the uh, public business company or the Bursa Malaysia decided that they should uh, revise this uh, code of uh, uh, corporate governance to help and assist the entity uh, to address these two important policies which is actually the anti-corruption and the visa growing uh, uh, mechanism. I mean, these are the two important, but of course, the other code of conduct uh, on corporate governance are also equally important and is all spelled out. One of the, the other two speakers will probably uh, uh, speak, uh, speak, spending some time to talk about this corporate governance uh, by the SC. So this is the code, of con uh, code on the corporate governance, which SC has developed basically to ensure broad uh, leadership and effectiveness, effective audit and risk management, and also to ensure integrity in reporting, the corporate reporting. Yeah. And as I said earlier, the ISO, ISO has developed this standard called the 37,000 governance of organization. We have spent many uh, man hours traveling this standard Usually a standard probably take three years. And for this standard, we took more than three years and published this about 46 page document. And this document to me, I think is a very useful document for all entity to use this as a guidance and also to help you to enhance on what is this corporate governance is about. We developed this principle, five important in principle. The purpose, the generation, value generation, strategy, oversight, and the accountability. And we allow this principle enabling these activities to engage the stakeholders. What we want to need, uh, need to know more about this leadership. What are the decisions and the data analysis to help us to make the right decision? Risk governance, social responsibility, and sustainability. And the outcome of this uh, implementation of this governance of the organization is purely effective performance, responsible stewardship, and ethic behavior. And now today, as you know, it's not only CSR, but of course, the EIG has become a, a buzzword, as I mentioned, uh, way back from the year 2005 and 2006. So it was Kofi Annan, the UN secretary then, coined this word and used it, this ESG. And today, we are all uh, very puzzled and equally puzzled and equally uh, uh, attentive, attentive to this word ESG as well. So what is this ESG? Now, basically, ESG uh, represents an organization effort to address these three important areas, social, uh, uh, what, uh, environmental, social, and governance. As you know, that uh, environmental focus on uh, and one third concerns such as the climate change and also uh, impact of their product on the uh, living world. Whereas the social aspect covers the uh, working environment, fair uh, workplace with uh, healthy and safety and employee relationship. And today, this G, this silent G is the most tricky part. And a lot of people talk, what is this G? Well, a lot of uh, us think that it covers the uh, board quality. But it's more than that. It also covers the uh, uh, compensation, anti-bribery, 
and also speak up mechanism, quality and diversity. Now let us uh, talk a little bit more. What is this G? Now this governance in this G is actually something that is beyond. Uh, 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 some of us thinking that when we implement ESG, it's just environmental and social. Now, this governance is, is something that shows uh, us about uh, what the, 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 the stakeholders should do. Yeah, it's also re re related to how the corporate use this uh, governance to establish. Basically, when Ga um, uh, Gandhi's definition was the trusteeship obligation inherent in the company's operation where access and resources are pooled and entrusted to the manager for an optimal utilization of the stakeholders' interest. And basically today we talk about this governance. We are trying to address four important principles. This is accountability, transparency, fairness, and responsibility for the best of the interests of the stakeholders, shareholders, and also the business as a whole. So this is what some of us believe that this is a G, which is now beyond just uh, board of directors required. Now, I do, do not want to emphasize so much what are this environmental and social uh, uh, framework, which has been uh, publicized quite a lot. But this G, governance, certain organization, even certain uh, initial organization may start to embark on this governance, they adopt this model called the uh, Robeco's the SAM model, which covers eight important areas. Governance, code of uh, business conduct, risk and crisis management, supply chain management, tax strategy, materiality, policy influences, and also impact management and valuation. But today, some organization who embark on ESG has go beyond this board of directors quality and also the diversity. I want to share with you some of this approach that the governance uh, index or the governance sustainability index are being used. For example, of course, governance, competition of the board, the uh, governing board, quality as well, the independent directors, their remuneration, uh, occupational discrimination, beneficial ownership. Today, a lot of countries have uh, set up this requirement, this law on the beneficial ownership. I think this is something that we need to talk. Corporate the integrity, prevention of corruption and whistleblowing policy. Anti-corruption or anti-competitive practices, code. And these are some of these areas which embark on the uh, requirement under the ESG. Now, most of us heard of this GRI. GRI is one of these uh, ESG the framework. And they also have uh, come out at least seven, seven standards uh, related to government. And some of them are the economic performance, market pre uh, presence, indirect economic impact, procurement practices, anti-corruption, anti-competitive behavior, and tax. So today in Malaysia, I think some of these organizations are using the GRI because as much as 53% of, of, uh, of these uh, companies who report doing some pretty substantive report are using this GRI as well. But what I'm trying to stretch is that these are some uh, elements which governance uh, in Malaysia uh, are being used by some of these companies. But beyond that, I also like to emphasize uh, some organization, for example, this company called the Cape uh, EMS uh, Berhad, believe that uh, they are embarking on this ESG, but the area covered Focus are based on these three principles. Environmental sustainability talks about their workplace, but with the health, safety, security, and environmental practices. Sustainability, uh, uh, social sustainability, it covers the fair labors and environmental practices. And under the governance, sustainability basically focus on the fair business practice. So this organization, for example, under the governance sustainability index itself, they place some important area which to address fair business practice. One of them, fair competition is very important when if we are going to, uh, to do business, but also to ensure fair uh, competition and antitrust law is addressed. If you are a public listed company, 
inside trading is important. Code for inside trading has to be ensure that they do not uh, uh, no, jeopardize this uh, requirement. In the public is the company, you have to ensure timely and correct reporting. So financial and business record is important to address in a timely and also correct manner. Ensure financial integrity so that we have a proper tax and also a trade control. So we have to be careful whether it's a tax avoidance or tax deviation. So most of these organizations in Malaysia, uh, we have, after having this uh, Section 17, Capital A, Corporate Liability Provision, most of the organization have to address this uh, bribery, which include anti-money laundry, bribery and facility payment, uh, gift and hospitality, charitable donation and political contribution. So most of us need to be alert, especially with the political activities and lobbying. By the way, Malaysia, we are going for our general election uh, this Saturday on November the 19th. So a lot of issues uh, have been uh, you know, brought out to the attention about political activities and lobbying as well. Now, I want to say a little bit about money laundering. Most of these organizations, for example, this company, they have actually put in place some guidance about what to do, what to report if there is a suspicious, uh, a suspicious uh, transaction uh, reporting and need to be carried out. And these are some of these proper governance that I think need to be addressed. Conflict of interest, fraud, breach of trust and abuse of power. So they are equally important that for a company to ensure governance, proper governance, they have to address this abuse of power and also the breach of trust as well. Fair purchasing. And this is where I think the whole, uh, down this whole supply chain is very important. We have to ensure a fair business, fair purchasing, select the uh, right uh, supply chain uh, business uh, associate that can help you and also to, to participate and support you in this journey towards governance and also the anti-bribery uh, program. Having a uh, code of conduct and also business ethics is important. Yeah, and of course today going beyond the IT is uh, cyber security protection, not only personal, but also company devices. There are rules, there are requirement now about company devices. And also lastly, I think most importantly is the privacy, data protection, and the confidential or the IP. Uh, for, uh, providers information that we have to secure. And also not only that, we have to ensure that this important information are not leaked out and also been uh, you know, uh, used by others. So I, to me, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is one of the few important government framework in Malaysia and uh, towards a new perspective of governance in the ESG, what is need to be spelled out in this governance in the ESG perspective. So with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. I have uh, give you a brief uh, a, a thought, uh, a brief uh, about my thought on this uh, governance in uh, EIG, especially in Malaysia. And I'm also looking forward to to, to this uh, session on uh, on, uh, on getting feedback under the Q&A. Thank you, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mm. Lloyd. Um, for a great overview in terms of uh, governance and context and the, the silent G in ESG, as you say. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Renu Chandra Segaram. <laughs> Segaram. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Renu is uh, the chair of the professional development for the MACD. And today we also have online uh, Paul Chan, who's the, um, you're the CEO, president, founder <laughs> of, of the Malaysian, all of the above. Thank you. Um, and Paul is, is also very involved in the global network of directors institutes. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Renu to give us a context from a director's and a governance perspective. Thank you. Thank you so slides. much, Carolyn. <laughs> thank you. I've also got slides. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Carolyn. And thank you so much to the Good Governance Academy for inviting me for today's session. I've just got about 10 to 12 minutes uh, to share with you, uh, everyone, on my 
area. Just give me a moment. I hope you can all see the slides. Okay. Right. Okay. Let me quickly say a little bit uh, a little bit about myself. I'm the Chair of Professional Development and the Faculty Member of MECD. I'm also in the Policy Committee of the Global Network of Director Institutes, GNDI, as well as the CEO and Principal Consultant of RC Compliance Consultancy and uh, we're together with MECD today. So it's a little bit about myself. I consult uh, with many major organizations on corporate liability on ISO 37001, anti-corruption, providing advisory on uh, corruption risk assessment, ESG and training and awareness. So that's a little bit about myself. Let me start by giving you from the highest regulator, really the regulatory perspective on corporate governance. Here we can see we have the Securities Commission of Malaysia, which is the governing body as the regulator that regulates the capital market and regulates the stock exchange of Malaysia, which in turn regulates public listed companies. The Securities Commission came out with the corporate Corporate Governance Strategic Priorities 2021-2023. So it was a, a part of, of the Capital Market Master Plan of the Securities Commission. When these corporate governance priorities came out, it was for this three-year period to govern listed companies and capital market players, as well as those that govern the organizations themselves, them being the directors. So in this sense, there are five main thrusts of the CG, we call it the CG priorities. It's designed to support listed companies in responding to the rise in a stakeholder economy. So it's not so much on profitability or making profits, but rather focusing on the needs of the stakeholder. And in that sense, the five key thrusts of the CG priorities are on board leadership, ESG fitness of the board, and we've heard Dr. Loy speaking about ESG requirements, and you, you've seen the breadth and depth of it. Here, what the CG strategic priorities require is that the board of directors have capacity in actually providing uh, ESG knowledge and to ensure that they are actually fit to um, oversee the enhanced reporting framework. On a three, it supports investor stewardship and engagement, their strategic trust four. This is on digital tools to enhance the CG transparency, corporate governance transparency to widen public access to corporate governance data to ensure uh, leading back to this transparency and deepen engagement with the youth on corporate governance and reaching academic studies as well as youth exposure. Now, when we talk about strengthening board leadership for agile responsibilities, strengthening ESG fitness of the boards, I would like to talk a little bit about ESG fitness of the board and, and what exactly with respect to these priorities is about. In these strategic trusts, each of them have got several initiatives. This priority two, which is this one, uh, ESG fitness of the board, priority two develops 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. 2.1 was really on leading the impact program for board capacity to ensure that they build their capacity on sustainability. A board could have capacity in finance, maybe in human resource, they could have in management, but are they strong enough as far as ESG oversight is concerned. Capacity building on sustainability for boards of middle and small cap companies. Large cap companies are uh, 
capitalization, capital capitalization, companies being uh, 2 billion and above, uh, Malaysia, 2 billion and above, they seem to have much stronger, more robust uh, ESG frameworks in place. So here in this 2.2 initiative is really on the boards of middle as well as small cap companies and really small cap companies are those that have well, were previously large SME, small and medium enterprises, which then later went to uh, obtain listing on the board. So they would be small cap companies in this respect. And finally, on 2.3, it's enhancing transparency on the sustainability practices of listed companies. This is very critical because very recently, in line with enhancing the transparency of listed companies, part of it was that the Bursa Malaysia, which is the stock exchange of Malaysia, had to develop after a period of, of exposure draft, after a period of obtaining feedback from directors, from public listed companies, from company secretaries, and all interested stakeholders and parties, including academicians. Subsequent to receiving that feedback, the Bursa Malaysia or the Malaysian Stock Exchange, the Malaysian Bourse, actually amended the listing requirements in order to provide greater transparency on the sustainability practices of listed issues. We'll go into that later, uh, a little bit later in today's presentation. So I'm conscious of the time. So let me quickly talk to you about Bursa Malaysia, PLC Public Listed Companies Transformation Program. Now this is a guidance to PLCs. It's all part of corporate governance. It's to ensure that PLC has that link between sustainability and long-term value value creation, and to ensure that they have a well-defined ESG response. And it's so critical on the, on the G part, the governance part. So the emphasis is, placing, is placed on implementing the E, the S, and the G as a company-wide approach and not just focused on the holding on a holding company or say corporate office, but rather if you have tentacles as a listed company throughout the world, that's even more necessary for you to have a company-wide approach. So this is really a guidance at a PLC transformation program. Now, what this, what I'd like to uh, highlight here is that in this, uh, it says here in Malaysia, 94% of uh, the top 50 PLCs have the ELS, uh, ESG strategies. However, only 62% embed them in the business strategies. And only 17% of them, this is critical, 17% of them have them actually assured, whether it's externally assured. And finally, 15% of that uh, part under labor relations, this is under the S. So this part on the external assurance, due to all of this later, the Bursa has come out with the amendments to the listing requirements to ensure greater transparency. So when we look at the PLC public listed companies and the listed issuers transformation program, governance is a core element of ESG, which Dr. Loy has gone to in very much detail, but just to, to highlight a little bit more, uh, a little bit on it, uh, board independence, risk management, compliance, corporate governance, anti-money laundering, anti-bribery corruption, cybersecurity, ethics, all of them falling under the pillar of G. And in this, uh, the governance context of ESG, we got to look at it two-pronged, corporate governance and sustainability governance. So the ESG response and the corporate governance would be how does a company manage its governance topics, these governance topics. To be very clear, in a sustainability statement, state clearly, as far as the regulator is concerned, to state clearly how have you managed these governance topics, like ethics, like fraud, like compliance, anti-bribery, anti-corruption. And sustainability uh, governance is how do you manage the overall sustainability response, the ESG response. And um, that too has to be stated. So the guidance pro is provided, um, linking sustainability with a value creation, as well as providing this. A follow on, as a follow on from that, 
Bursa Malaysia amended the listing requirements on the 26th of September. It's now published. It enhances, uh, provides the enhanced sustainability reporting framework. And one important aspect is when a sustainability statement is actually published by a listed issuer, starting from the financial year and 31st December 2023, that is just next year, starting from the end of next year, all sustainability statements must have an added statement called ESG assurance. That means you have to state whether or not your statement has been reviewed by your internal auditor or you have had an external assurance aligned with some recognized assurance standards. And uh, Dr. Loy has stated on GRI. However, under the Bursa amendments, they require for a, a focal point on TCFD, Task Force for Climate Disclosure, particularly on climate disclosure requirements. Now, why, why do we need this? In addition to having that assurance on the sustainable state statement, you, Whoever uh, gives that assurance must also disclose the conclusions. It is really to enhance the credibility. And uh, some very material, 10 common sustainability matters across all sectors, regardless of what sector your particular PLC is in, there are 10 common uh, matters which you must disclose according to the regulator. Uh, these, I've only provided an extract, there are 10 of them, but uh, if you read through, uh, read through them, you will find that at the top is on anti-corruption. And this is one of the governance pillars. Anti-corruption is so important with a common indicator which you have to, to uh, disclose over a three-year period. What's the percentage of employees that have received training on anti-corruption by employee category? Percentage of operations assessed for corruption-related risks, which means you need to conduct corruption risk assessment in your organization? And what are the confirmed incidences of corruptions as well as the actions that you've taken as an organization? That means having that kind of whistleblowing mechanism and, and also investigations, internal uh, verification, validation, investigations, corporate wise, and then disclose it. So we can't really run away as far as the regulators have concerned. Now, wh where does that actually flow from? As has been touched earlier, the National Anti-Corruption Plan of Malaysia, the NACP 2019-2023, uh, it is the vision was to ensure that Malaysia is a corrupt-free nation and we are the mission is to know that Malaysia is known for her integrity and not corruption. Therefore, the Section 17 Capital A of the MACC Act uh, was then developed and uh, promulgated 2018 and forced 2020. It's specifically offenses for commercial organizations, corruption offenses on that, whereby the uh, penalty would be for directors facing a possible jail term up to 20 years and a company facing a minimum fine upon prosecution, upon conviction, a uh, minimum fine of 1 million. 1 million ringgit and not USD. And with that, I've come to the end of uh, my particular session today. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, over to you. Over to you, Caroline. So I'm just going to stop sharing screen now. Thank you so much, Renu. I had a bit of noise in the background, but it was really a very insightful presentation. Thank you. And just to everyone online, the presentation is available um, online now for downloading. So thank you very much. We um, Thank you, Renu. Are you going to share your screen now? You can introduce um, Paul. Oh, I'm sorry, Caroline, you had the background noise. I'm so sorry. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, just to introduce Paul now. Paul, thank you so much for, for being with us. We are honored to have you here today. I believe you're going to share some thoughts with us in this regard as well. And then we'll uh, move over to questions and answers from the audience. Thank you.
Uh, sorry, Paul, you're still on mute. Goes. The mic is on mute. Well, I think you're on mute. It's an informed call, so unmute the mic. Okay, you you're unmuted now. Yes, we can. Thank you, Paul. Oh, you muted me now. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, do you see my screen? Yes, it's very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me go back to the beginning. Yeah, just a brief introduction of my uh, myself. Uh, uh, my name is Paul Chan. I'm the president of the Malaysian Alliance of Corporate Directors. It's a, it's a pro bono service. I'm not a CEO, uh, although I run as a CEO. Uh, I am actually a, a, a practicing corporate director. I serve on a few of the public and private boards and for the last almost 20 years. So in, uh, uh, I thought it's the best way to learn more is to share with other people what I have experienced. We, every one of us has different experience and different environment. So I've been the president of Malaysian Alliance of Corporate Directors. I'm very much involved with the Global Network of Director Institute as well as the investor for IRC, the Central Reporting. Uh, in fact, recently they formed an organization called IRCC. They're trying to get the uh, integral reporting all integrated into, into a, a cohesive report. Right, and the I R that is integrated reporting, uh, connectivity council to integrate everything into into one. Uh, let me see how I get rid of this. Uh, okay. okay. Now I, I'm an accountant by tra training by profession. I am a chartered accountant, also a fellow of this uh, a CPA Australia. Right. So I look at it from this point of view, from the accountant perspective, because accountant's role now uh, has, has, has literally expanded to such extent to cover quite a large area, not just financial. And that is also the responsibility of the board of directors as well. As directors, we are not just looking to governance internally, but also as broadening the scope. All right. Now, I, I present this uh, to you, <clears throat> is that uh, this is a reality today, right? Uh, in in uh, in 1975, you notice that the uh, uh, large part of the company's value, right, is is, is on uh, tangible assets. In other words, there's a transactional assets that you can record in the financial uh, statements. But today, 45 years later, they found that the large part of the value of the company are intangible, and only tangible assets are reflected in the balance sheet. Now, that is where I challenge my own uh, 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 fraternity that the accountants must also wake up because we don't take in intangible assets into the balance sheet. It's not reflected in the financial statement. So to an extent that sometimes they look at the financial statement, uh, we do not fully see the whole picture of what, how the company uh, fare in performance, right? I met up with this interesting- Sorry, uh, sorry, Paul, uh, just to interrupt. Um, if you could maybe put your sound up a little bit. Um, I think people are having a problem uh, okay. hearing you clearly. Right. Sorry, yes, can, there we go. Thank you, you sorry back? about that. Yes, okay, much right, better, right. thank you. Okay, so I, I, in, in, in 2016, I came across this book called The End of Accounting. It's written by uh, Professor Baruch Love and a social professor from Great. I had a fortune to meet up with uh, Professor uh, Love uh, three years ago in, uh, in New York. And a good conversation with him about how we come up with this uh, accounting uh, title that's very provoking to many accountants, right? The end of accounting. Basically, he's not talking about the end of accounting, it's not important, but the accounting uh, reporting framework could be expanded. For example, I said that you know, in the old days, account, just now I show you the, the, the chart that, that shows that the account, accounting uh, financial reporting is only now on average uh, the we, we, we assured only 10% of the, of the uh, physical assets, all right? 90% of value of the company is intangible. So we come up to this conclusion. They said that if we do not recognize the capital that we invested in non-tangible uh, non assets, we are missing the whole point. In fact, give me a very profound uh, answer is that, for example, that we, nobody will compete, nobody will complain or nobody will, uh, uh, Sort of ignore the fact that investment in human capital is paramount in today's market, where everybody is looking towards human capital investment, right? But where does human capital comes to? In the financial balance sheet, 
in the PL account, the more you invest in my capital, the worse it performs. So it doesn't make sense. So he's talking about all these issues, you know. And I've summarized uh, th this issue for us to see that uh, it's so important for us to review and relook and even reinvent the accounting profession, right? Now, the issue of sustainability came into play, as you heard from the previous two speakers. It, it, it is really coming into, into a very much forefront now, all right? What is sustainability here? Sustainability development. Sustainable development is development which meets the needs of present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's what definition by the World Commission of the Environment and Development, right? Now we come to the ESG, which we talk so much about. Now, although directors responsibility overall in governance, uh, Traditionally, it's been internal uh, composition of the board and so on and so forth, you know, but now expanded to a bigger role. That ESG element that covers the environmental aspect, the social aspect, the governance aspect of the company that existing in the environment they're operating in, right? And uh, ESG has been developed to such an extent that the regulators the re uh, has come up with the various framework the ISB framework, the uh, uh, the EU taxonomy framework, the FDR SFD framework at the top, right? And that filters down to various standards of reporting framework, which cover GRI, ISO, uh, CDP, CDSB, IRC, value reporting, and so on, right? To meet the global goal, which is set by the United Nations and also by World Economic Forum, on sustainability, sustainable development goals, the um, the uh, <clears throat> the greenhouse gas protocol, the SDG or social development uh, goal, and so on. Right. Just now, uh, Dr. Loy was talking about the ISO uh, 37, uh, 37,000. This has been adopted. The International Bank of G. And in South Africa, the King 4 is uh, applicable to South Africa. It was published in 2016 and now become an international standard. This is one of the standards beside and beyond all the other standards we're talking about, right? This is well covered by uh, Professor Dr. Loy. Okay. So you look at it from the board perspective, there's so many proliferation of exporting standards to an extent that sometimes we wonder whether most of our energy uh, is, is really uh, right and fully deployed in creating value for the company, or is it that we are just in compliance with the regulators, right? So there's so many different sort of frameworks that come into play. Integral reporting has come up with their own uh, framework and incorporate this into the, meet the SDG goal as well. At the same time, what integral reporting come up with is that uh, we are talking about integrated value creation with integrated thinking strategy. Now, whatever that we do at the end of the day, the company must perform. So the outcome of what we do has got to be measurable. It's got to be uh, add value to the whole business that uh, the company is operating within without eroding the environment or without, uh, without uh, disadvantaging the, the, uh, the workers and social issue and so on, right? So to give you some comparison, comparison of what are all these standards aiming for, you have the GRI, which is most uh, well adopted because it started at the very beginning. Um, the, 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 the one who is leading the, uh, the uh, standards, GRI, a global reporting initiative. The Sustainable Accounting Standard Board, they also come up with a standard. They have uh, developed 77 different framework for different industry because there's no one size fits all. Right, then the United Nations has come up with the United Nations SDG, right? They call it the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Sustainability Sustainable Development Goals. Now, CT, CTCFD, just I mentioned very briefly, Task Force on Climate uh, Task Force on Climate uh, Disclosure, Financial Disclosure, has come to the forefront. Even as we speak to it now, uh, there is a meeting in uh, Egypt. But at COP27, they're addressing all this issue. And climate issues is put right to the forefront of all this reporting. 
So you see that the the market, the world has been developed, uh, uh, changing so rapidly, right? Uh, that we can hardly catch up with all these various standards, right? And this year, you know that the uh, the uh, COP twenty six announced that uh, the IFRS should develop a, a global baseline standard, and the IFRS to get a VRF, the Value Reporting Foundation, right, uh, to develop the system uh, global baseline standard, supposedly to be out this year, before the end of the year. But it looks like uh, it's going to be delayed until 20, probably the first quarter, if not the first half of next year, right? So under the IFRS Foundation, which is under IFAC, the International Federation of Accountants, uh, together with the International Accounting Standard Board, right, it, uh, they formed this organization for IIS, ISSB, or International Sustainability Standard Board, which is made up of VRF and integral reporting together with a CDSB, right? Climate Disclosure Standard Board. They try to harmonize the whole system, harmonize the whole uh, corporate reporting system. So today, um, both integral reporting and uh, value reporting uh, under ISSB together with CDP, okay? And this is where it comes into. TCFD and the World Economic Forum and recognized by ISCO, the International Organization for Security Commission, uh, uh, are moving towards this kind of standard, ISSB standard, right? Now, you know the ISCO has adopted the IFRS globally, okay? So I reckon that by the time we adopt ISSB, we will be probably, uh, uh, adopting this global baseline standard for capital markets around the world, right? What was this uh, reporting all about the economic crisis? In COP26, this was addressed to, to, to uh, call the countries, I mean, have the countries to reach a net zero by 2050, right? And keep their global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius and protect the ecosystem and habitats. Mobilize finance. Now, this is where the incentive of incorporating uh, uh, this uh, sustainable reporting into the company financials, all right? Because this is where the financial institution be evaluating the company, uh, whether they are qualified to, uh, to, to be supported financially to green bonds and other things, you know, and collaboration with other organizations to achieve that. So even as we speak now, today, 18 of November, they're still talking about it. COP27 now, we talk about reducing emission, which is actually related to climate. So that's why TCFD has pushed to the forefront, helping countries to prepare for and deal with climate change. As you're aware, the climate today has already disrupted a lot of businesses. So, right? so board of directors must be sensitive about all these things that are developing, otherwise in fact into the value creation of the company and that's securing technical support and funding to developing countries for all this above. This is the element of reporting under TCFD. Right? In your corporate reporting, you cover area like governance, strategy, risk management, which I've uh, covered before by, by Reno and also uh, Dr. Loy. Okay, and the last part is, uh, uh, risk management actually is part of board responsibility, but now extending to manage climate as well, climate uh, related risk as well. And then the matrices and targets. Now, this is one of the most uh, sort of challenging part to measure objectively the, the target. In Malaysia, our chairman of the stock exchange has already declared that companies that ignore ESG will be deprived of equity and debt financing. Our central bank has come with a taxonomy also to, to qualify borrowers uh, uh, to meet this kind of a uh, target, ESG target, all right? So many financial institutions have already mobilized funds for sustainable finance. What is sustainable finance here? Basically, actually, the finance, uh, financial resources set aside to, for companies that comply with the ESG uh, standard. That is where it's coming from, right? Uh, you look at it, there's so many different types of uh, standard. How do we begin as the board of directors? I've been in touch with this, this organization, the uh, ESG Exchange. They're developing uh, a playbook, so to say, enough for sustainable reporting. 
the mandatory reporting uh, it will it will it will become mandatory eventually all right so for sustainable reporting by companies around the world so that there is a comparability there is a benchmarking there is a uh, you may say a assurable framework of compliance right so the exchange has come up with, with something you know they call it international consensus on how to create sustainable reports so there is a, a, a format that there is a benchmarking against for example delivery to global collaboration with standard setters with regulators with accountants with direct institutes and corporates as well as industry certification body so here you have the resources for corporate directors for I, uh, in corporate reporting for IFRS uh, financial reporting ISSB su sustainability report as well as corporate readiness data how to get the data assurance integrity report and so on all right so this is a, this is the knowledge exchange all right uh, for implementation I won't go to the detail of it there's a lot of details in gathering data in analyzing data in using technology and uh, also there's a there's a program also to certify uh, as international certification to benchmark against those who are preparing for the ESG reporting, right? And also uh, preparing the assurers, independent assurers, to assure that the uh, the reporting is what they say it is. So this is a process the exchange has come up with the five modules of label provided to clear, provides clear and concise how tos, right? Data and technology. One, one module, operational processes, business analytics, auditable project uh, report, production and repeatability and refinement. So we are all entering a new frontier. And in this new frontier, there's so much, move, so many, so many of the moving parts. And sometimes we're so confused. We're trying to distill it down to a global baseline standard. That is where the ISSB is trying to achieve. And this program uh, is in compliance or rather in alignment with ISB standard. So this is a very brief uh, presentation. And uh, if there's any question, I would be glad to uh, take the question. All right. Thank you, thank very you much, so Dr. much. Back to you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and thank you, Dr. Loy and Renu. I think uh, we can open up for questions now, if there's anyone who has any questions. Um, we've got lots of, lots of comments. Um, I think the one the one question I have is in terms of the adoption of um, the Malaysian standards, and perhaps this is to you, Dr. Loy, in terms of the adoption of the standards uh, in Malaysia, um, is it just you know the large listers, or do you see there is a um, a need or or a want or a desire to follow corporate governance principles by organisations that are are bigger than um, you know just the large listed? Thanks. Uh, I mean, bigger, everyone. smaller. Sorry. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the ISO 37000, which is the governance of organization, is actually one very useful standard or document, which all stakeholders, whether it is the large or medium or even SME, can use it as a management tool to help them to address this corporate, corporate uh, governance in their uh, organization. Uh, remember, uh, we spent more than four years, uh, you and me spent more than four years debating and uh, developing this standard, designing standards, so that uh, we really put in a lot of effort and uh, you know, uh, cross visiting all these uh, reference documents and make sure that this is one of the useful tools, a document that it can be used across uh, the, all the stakeholders. And I think it's a very important document uh, sadly, in Malaysia, uh, we have not adopted into our Malaysian standard yet. What I'm trying to say is that uh, Malaysia has adopted the ISO 37001, which is the anti-bribery measuring system, and also the ISO 37002, which is the whistleblowing management system, and adopt it as equivalent under the Malaysian standard. And I believe this is also an important document. I strongly urge that perhaps the authorities and the various stakeholders come forward and uh, push uh, the authorities like the Department of Standards, Malaysia, the BUSA, 
and the others uh, agency to use this document uh, as handy as he said. After all, uh, these standards are reference and guidance and they are not mandatory documents to be used. So I would strongly urge that, yes, uh, a lot of uh, uh, like-minded men, people uh, put out in their uh, many hours and many days to develop this standard and this is no doubt a very good standard for start to use to establish uh, governance uh, in an organization. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Loy. I have a question for you, Rainu. Um, your, in, in your programs that you develop, is it mainly for large listed entities um, or do you find that directors are looking for, in Malaysia specifically, are looking for development in the smaller entities or various other different types of organizations? I would say that most of the programs are geared towards the larger entities. The smaller organizations are also required, although there's no mandatory uh, requirements in that sense, but yes, they do reach out for assistance. And there is as well for SMEs that uh, kind of guidance on ESG. Of course, it's not as comprehensive as what the regulators have given because they're, you know, the smaller companies, the SMEs are not required, to, uh, are not mandated. But those that adopt the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, they have been provided with guidance on how to implement it on a much smaller scale within their organization. So yes, I although I do... Uh, target more towards the larger companies, the PLCs. Uh, I also uh, assist the smaller organizations. I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, absolutely. And, and maybe for, uh, just to carry on from that, when you do do the training, what are the main areas of concern do you find that directors have uh, in Malaysia in terms of understanding in their, their corporate governance role? I would think uh, one of the critical part because regulators require you to require PLCs to write out the sustainability statement. One problem is greenwashing and rather just uh, adhering to the letter of the law, but not its spirit. So another problem that they also have is another issue that uh, directors also have is on obtaining the kind of metrics that is required to be revealed or required to be put into the statements. That becomes an issue as well. Dr. Loy, from your perspective, are you seeing, um, you know, are you providing guidance in terms of the that missing data? I think that's a big issue for many, many organizations. Uh, obviously, I think that is where it started. Uh, the logic of the ESG. Now, ESG has different uh, type of uh, framework which you can choose. And Renu had just mentioned that our Busan Malaysia in the year 2023 has actually uh, set out a requirement is to adopt the TCFD uh, uh, framework to measure the, the you know, uh, climate-related financial reporting disclosure. But if you look into the word ESG itself, what does ESG stand for? Three important aspects of sustainability and not just talking about a financial or environmental perspective. And that is where I'm coming from, that there is still a silent G, which a lot of stakeholders are still not moving out, getting into it, and to share and tell the public mm. what are these G is about. Mm, moreover, moreover, mm -hmm. we are talking about disclosing a non-financial ESG report. I don't know why you have to emphasize the word financial reporting in that angle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Loy. And a final question. We've got one minute. I'm going to end with Paul. Paul, a question to you. You are, participate a lot on the global stage. Um, how does Malaysia fare in terms of its uh, approach to corporate governance on a global uh, um, compared with the global uh, markets? Uh, well, uh, uh, Malaysia as a country, uh, we are still uh, a developing country, right? And we are a supply chain to many of these developed uh, countries in terms of the products that we send to them, right? 
uh, we are well aware of the, uh, the the changing marketplace, and uh, Malaysia is one of the signatory to the Climate Accord, Paris Climate Accord. So we are complying with that. Okay, uh, but I think from the board perspective, many of the board members, whether public company, especially private company, the smaller company, they don't see that this issue of uh, reporting is really uh, sort of uh, beneficial, or they cannot see the performance, the the, re the, the real value of it. They consider this if the regulators ask them to comply, well, we have no choice. You know, they just have comply, all right. But on the other hand, I think the approach that we have to apply to this uh, local industry is to really spend uh, more time in uh, helping them to understand the value proposition of the mm. implementation of sustainability and issue of ESG. Uh, as Dr. Lloyd rightly pointed out, uh, climate is one. Key, one key element, in fact, because of all this climate, the global climate uh, uh, initiative, this has pushed to the forefront. But for a company as a whole, financial, whether you like it or not, this is a lifeline or the lifeblood of a company. Right? Mm. They have to perform. Right? If you don't have a cash flow one, two years, they probably have to close down. That's why the, the recent lockdown, many companies are affected. Okay, So, uh, so where I'm coming from is that uh, we have to bring forth to the industry the value proposition. That's I'm very much inclined to the integral reporting, integrated value creation, integrated thinking, because the whole thing that we are looking at as, as the board of directors, to discharge our fiduciary responsibility, we have to look at the overall of the company to ensure the company is, uh, is healthy, performing well, which ensure the company uh, has a good cash flow and, and, and all the other assets that uh, make the company move forward. Right. Mm. So this part, I think, is not very, really, have not really been a sort of uh, emphasized very much. So most of the company have to comply, they do it, you know, but they don't really value it. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you so much. I know we've run out of time. So thank you to everyone who stayed online just to finish off. I think that was a great um, end statement. Thank you so much, Dr. Loy. Thank you, Renu. Thank you so much, thank Paul, you. for arranging us to just get a little bit of an insight into governance in Malaysia. Thank you, everyone. Thank Our thank next event is, is governance in the UK and the United Kingdom, and that's happening on the 6th of December, and we'll be sending out a notification on that. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.